morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for attending this session. I'll be talking about affirmative action in South Africa particularly. It's an interesting case study, particularly because uh, South Africa has a long history of racial segregation, but also racial segregation, particularly by a minority group towards a majority group. Uh, and this historical legacy, as I'll show to you, hasn't necessarily been reduced, despite an aggressive affirmative action policy which hasn't seemed to narrow the gaps. And the question is, is why and why not? So what this paper will do is it will really monitor the effects of the, the racial wage gap over time, and it'll monitor particular points and junctures uh, where we find that laws have been updated to try and achieve racial equality. So we know that discrimination hurts incomes of various groups. If the majority discriminates against the minority, such as in the USA, then it's typically the minority whose incomes have uh, get affected. But as in the case of South Africa, where you typically have a minority discriminator, particularly the white population that discriminated against the black African population, then all incomes are affected. It's not really good for the situation in the long run. And Gary Becker in his Nobel Prize lecture actually suggested that this is why apartheid, the apartheid policy faced its demise. By conjecture, what should have happened is, is that once apartheid was formally dismantled, where uh, job reservation was removed, by conjecture, all of this should have, uh, all the differences should have imploded, and we should have seen a new trajectory of equality, if that is true. But this is really not the case that we've seen. We, we haven't seen racial wage gaps disappear. And despite these targeted policies, which as I'm going to outline for you in just a second, have been very, uh, very targeted, but not necessarily had the effect. So we'll look at some empirical estimates from survey data to, to try and show these changes. Just to give you a background of uh, institutionalized waste discrimination in South Africa, most of you would be aware of uh, the apartheid, grand apartheid, which basically instituted job reservation, uh, particularly favoring white individuals. However, what many people don't know is, is that this predated apartheid and job reservation actually started much earlier than 1948 when the apartheid laws were inst instituted. The other important aspect here is, is that also the apartheid laws banned African unions, which really removed bargaining power of Africans vis-a-vis -vis their white counterparts. So the early evidence suggests that by the 1970s, when there was a significant history of racial segregation, uh, white men earned about five and, five and a half times more than black men, particularly due to job reservation. Uh, some skilled jobs were reserved for white people, and unskilled jobs were reserved for black people. In the 1980s, there was a narrowing of the wage gap. Uh, this was partially due to increases in attributes, but also due to the unbanning of black unions, which led to a convergence of wages across the groups. But it didn't necessarily remove the discriminatory component uh, within the labor market. Uh, unexpectedly, in 1994, when democracy appeared and when a lot of these laws were dismantled, we actually witnessed a widening wage gap, and especially also the discrimination component of it. So this wasn't due to necessarily greater gaps in uh, productive characteristics such as education. In actual fact, uh, discrimination improved, uh, uh, worsened. Um, one of the reasons for this might be is, is that there were actually no formal laws yet in place to counter discrimination uh, effectively. This only came in after 1998, as I'll discuss in just a second. So the, the laws are really important in this section. From 2000 onwards, uh, there was an active affirmative action policy, but the evidence that is available at this stage suggests that there was a negligible effect at the mean incomes. There was, however, a positive effect at the top of the income distribution where wage gaps narrowed at the top of the income distribution. This suggests that affirmative action has had the effect of uh, removing discrimination within the elite, but not necessarily for the average worker in the labor market. Uh, this led to actually the term which we call broad-based black economic empowerment, which means that it was supposed to reach the entire income distribution, not just the top of the income distribution. So what I'm going to do in this paper is I'm going to show you that we're going to look at, monitor the effects of these targeted affirmative action policies and to see whether this changed uh, a lot of the trajectories. We 
because the evidence has been mixed, what we're also going to look is we're going to look at unobserved generational heterogeneity. It's not something which we can look at the individual level uh, because in, typically in these studies there are a lot of unobservables which we really do worry about. So in 1993, the Instrum Constitution laid the foundation for affirmative action, but it didn't necessarily start implementing it. This only started happening in 1998 with the Employment Equity Act, which, as it suggests, it eliminated any unfair discrimination on paper. Uh, there were positive development objectives towards black individuals, coloured, which in South Africa means mixed race, it's the official terminology. Uh, Indian, but also towards women and disabled. The interesting thing here is, is that this also included white women because they were classified uh, along the gender dimension. The, the employment equity particularly targeted firms above the age, uh, above the size of 50, in other words, firms that were large. Um, and this is particularly with reference to the fact that South Africa has a very small, small firm sector a large dearth of small firms and that industry is quite concentrated. So the uh, exception is in place to allow small firms to not be burdened by overregulation. But in 2003 this policy was stepped up a bit as I've suggested the BBEE and as you'll see by the title of this act it particularly focuses on race and removes to some degree the gender dimension. Um, because it focuses particularly on black individuals. Okay? And black in this sense is broadly defined, not just black Africans. For instance, uh, Asian individuals are also counted as black under this law. So it went beyond workplace regulation, it went beyond employment equity, but towards positive opportunity in all facets of life. So it really looked at the empowerment of black people, including women, workers, youth, people with disabilities, and people living in rural areas. And the important part here is this, at the bottom here is this balanced scorecard which firms have to re require. They basically, they develop a scorecard which each firm gets a point which works as some sort of accreditation. And this accreditation allows firms to find government contracts. It also creates the opportunity for firms to interact with each other if they want to work with credible firms. Okay. It also helps in public-private partnership uh, and also when licenses are applied for. Uh, you'll see that a lot of firms would advertise and they'd tell you your BBE certification. Okay, this is an important uh, component. And as you'll see here, this is how the BEE scorecard worked. It looked at direct empowerment through also not just employment as the 1998 Employment Equity Act did, it also looked at the the demographic constituents of ownership. It also looked at the management of the firms, who's in charge of directing the firms, but also what was previously covered by the Employment Equity Act only counts 15% of this BEE score. There's also a skills development component to actively promote the workforce, but also indirect empowerment and it's this preferential procurement and socioeconomic development. This part here is very key to understanding how the policy worked, as is this part. Uh, because it doesn't just focus on what happens within the labour market, it focuses on what happens outside the labour market, uh, and also firms' interactions with each other. In South Africa, we, there's this term which we call tenderpreneurs. It's basically entrepreneurs who have been able to leverage their positions, their BEE positions, to be able to get preferential procurement, which has led to a lot of corruption and to the creation of an elite. And this is an important thing. So typically when people look at survey data, they turn to the classic Wahaka Blinder decomposition and they decompose gaps, wage gaps into observable components and unobservable components. And the unobservable component is then just seen as discrimination. But the important part here, which we often don't think about, is, is the fact that unobservables are not uh, randomly distributed across racial groups. And in South Africa, this is particularly true because some of those unobservables are, importantly, for instance, the quality of schooling. 
which we know is very highly unequal and very uh, polarized, the distribution, where the top 20% of schools is performing very well, but the bottom 80% of schools are dysfunctional. And this is still distributed across racial groups. And this is an important and observable, which is a pre-labor market discrimination, which uh, we often cannot account for in just simple decompositions like this. So what we really want to address here is this unobservable. I'll show you we won't perfectly address it, uh, but we start to arrive at a solution. Um, typically, these unobservables produce upward estimates of this unobservable discrimination component. And as I've suggested, quality of schooling is the main one. There is a study that gives an indicative evidence that school quality presents about 75% of the unobserved component. So it really, what we would call labor market discrimination is actually largely pre-labor market discrimination, which suggests that there's a barrier to entry into good jobs into the labor market as a result of the hindrance of poor school quality. Now, the one thing which we can note here is, is that school quality is distinctly varies by generation. Um, people entering through the same schooling system. Also, because a lot of the, the laws surrounding schooling affected particular generations in South Africa, such as, for instance, the Bantu Education Act, which was also an apartheid era law, which limited black African individuals to the type of schools they could attend. And these were typically poor schools. So, Particular generations could attend particular type of schools and therefore the way we're going to tackle the problem of unobservables is by taking the unobservable up from the individual to the generation. It, it won't account for absolutely all the unobservables but it will start arriving at better estimates to what we used to have. We also have additional problems here which I won't discuss in much detail. So our approach attempts to address these shortcomings. Because of problems of common support, we limit ourselves to individuals who have eight years or more education. This is quite simply because very few white individuals have primary school education or lower in South Africa. And that, that, address, that suggests this whole problem of varying schooling experiences, which then have an impact on the labor market. We also restrict our sample to formal sector workers because we assume that a lot of the, legal, the laws that have been implemented do not necessarily affect informal sector workers directly. We use the post-apartheid labor market series. We, we use it from 1997 to 2011. Um, there was no earnings data in 2008 to 2009 that was formally published. Uh, so we do have some gaps in those time series, which I'll show you. What is our approach? We, we decompose the changes in the wage gaps to try and arrive at uh, the uh, unobservables. But what we do so is we specifically look at this within the same birth cohorts by looking at variation within particular birth cohorts to try and account for the fact that different birth cohorts have different unobservables. Okay? So we, we rely on a less stringent assumption, even though it, it doesn't necessarily hold perfectly, is that once we control for a look within the cohort, that the unobservables across race would be more likely to be randomly distributed across race, even if not completely. So to look at this cohort type of analysis, we borrow elements from age period cohort tradition, uh, particularly the, the name here that economists would know most is Deaton, who looked at this most effectively within our context. What we do is we look at the change in the wage gap relative to a base period, and we're going to start with 1997, just before the Employment Equity Act was implemented. We avoid looking at data before that because there's survey, survey idiosyncrasies. And essentially what we do end up with is an initial component which relies basically on changes in coefficients. Um, which is typically what we would understand from a waka blinded decomposition. Then we have a second component, which is just a change in productivity, because we know, for instance, education has been strongly converging across race groups in South Africa. We then have an interaction term, which needs a bit of unpacking. And what you'll see is, is that there's two components, and I'm going to emphasize the first term, because essentially what it suggests, it's the increase in white attributes, but valued at the initial discrimination. 
So this does measure a, some form of discrimination, but it's a persistent form of discrimination. What we're measuring in this green bit is the changes in discrimination that has happened. What we're measuring with this bit is a persistent part of the discrimination. There is also a small second term, but because what we're going to see is, is that this blue term increases, this is not as important. Even though, for instance, what we observe is, is that the returns to education for black African individuals, particularly the returns to higher education, have increased. This should be important, but we don't find that necessarily to be the dominant change in this identity. Just to give you an idea, this is the evolution of the average white wage for formal sector above eight education. The dotted line is for black individuals. And what we have here is the wage gap. As I suggested, the wage gap increased even beyond 1998 when employment equity was introduced, but only started declining at a later stage. We also, there could be problems here with changes in server design. The instrument changed uh, along this period, but it could also be differential responses to business cycle phases as this came shortly after the financial crisis. And what we generally do see is, is that the, um, yeah, we also can just recast this by cohort. And what we see is, is that uh, wages are declining across cohort, but I don't want to emphasize this because there's also an age effect in here. What we see is, is that across cohort, the, uh, this top green line is, is that the wage gap is actually remaining quite constant. If we just do this with the usual Oaxaca blinder decomposition in each time period, what we see is, is that uh, this, wage, this increasing wage gap only declining much later towards 2011. Uh, we actually don't see this, any decline in this uh, discrimination component, not systematically, except perhaps towards the end of the period. So if you consider this 2003 as a threshold point when this aggressive black economic empowerment came into play, it didn't seem to have any effect whatsoever. But if you apply this, this new approach, we can look at this green term, which is the change in discrimination relative to 1997. We actually see that this started picking off after 2004. Recall, however, that the, this blue component is also a part of component which represents the increase in white characteristics as if discrimination had remained constant across time. That is increasing. Okay. So what does it suggest to us? It suggests to us that there's two components of discrimination that are moving in opposite directions. This is the one that has been affected by the implementation of black economic empowerment. It represents the pure change in discrimination which we observe as a result of the change in the laws. But this component here is not, not changing whatsoever. So what does it suggest to us? It suggests to us that the, if we go back to exactly what that means, this bit over here, it suggests that the reduction in the, uh, for instance, the, uh, the wage, the attributes of white individuals, it's, it's not being, uh, the value, it's not being revalued in that sense, and we therefore do not see that reduction in the, uh, in the uh, discrimination component. So what do we know? Well, we know that racial wage gaps declined before the end of apartheid. It increased in the period shortly after the transition. We do not see a massive effect for the 1998 Employment Equity Act, even though it's something one would expect. Even despite the fact that uh, tertiary education, the returns to tertiary education increased for the black population, this gives us an idea that perhaps these reforms weren't broad-based enough. They weren't affecting the entire distribution. And this is something which you would find being spoken about in the discourse quite extensively. It's only the 2003 BEE Act that does start seeing a change in one component of discrimination, but in not all components of discrimination, which suggests to us that even this hasn't had the desired effect to change the face of the labor market in a big way. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.